Hey everyone, and thanks for coming to check out my video. For those of you who don't know, this talk was originally given as part of the New York City Game Audio and Game Audio Network Guild lecture series. And being that that takes place in New York, a lot of people online that I met expressed interest but weren't able to make it due to either time constraints or just not living around in the New York area. So I decided to do the next best thing and record a new version just for you guys on YouTube here. The problem is that it was originally meant for an audience, so there's some interactivity, but we can easily just breeze past all of those parts, and really all the important information will still be exactly the same. I would also like to point out that I am not an artist. In making this, I used lots of Creative Commons art and stuff like that, so at the end of the video, or in the description below, I'll have a credit screen with all the people who made all this wonderful art you'll see. And so if you ever see something and need to know who that is, that's where you'll find it. Lastly, before we get started, I wanted to talk a bit about how I chose this medium for this talk. Because I've noticed that I go to panels and lectures a lot because I really just love learning. I love hearing people who are passionate about what they do speak about it. But I noticed that no matter how cutting edge the talk is, 90% of the time they have just a PowerPoint or a video or a slideshow or just something like that. So when I was going to give my talk, that was of course the default first thought I had. But then I realized that's almost kind of ironic considering that in this talk, my whole point is not to just default and figure out how what you're working with can actually enhance the point you're trying to make, or the story in this case, rather than just defaulting to what people expect it to work as. So I decided to give this talk in the form of an actual visual novel, because what better way to demonstrate visual novels than an actual visual novel? So in this talk, you'll get to hear things in context, and I hope my choice to do it in a visual novel for you will be a sort of metaphor for why defaulting to what you might expect, while it might work, won't always necessarily be the most effective. So with all of that out of the way, let's get started. So welcome everyone. How many of you know what a visual novel is? Obviously, you can actually answer, and a lot of you will probably know, but just to be on the safe side, I'm going to assume that you don't. So, a visual novel, often stylized as a VN, is a text-based game that's best described as an interactive book. They can occasionally have other game mechanics and often feature choices, but the major focus is the text of the story. For the purposes of this talk, we'll be limiting the conversation to creative use of music, not sound design. Sound effects might come up every once in a while because they're similar in use and often can provide the same sort of functions we'll be looking at, but for the purposes of this talk, we're going to focus on music. The two disciplines are so linked in interactive mediums that it'll be hard to completely talk about one without the other, though. So for the interest of time, we'll be solely focused on the music. Specifically, we'll examine and discuss some of the ways that music can be used to enhance your visual novel. It's something that I think gets neglected all too often in favor of simple loops. Music in a visual novel can be so much more dynamic than just hitting play and leaving it running. Yet unfortunately, in researching this topic, I found almost no resources on the topic. There were only even a handful of forum posts asking about how to approach the music. And in my opinion, sadly, most of them simply seemed to think the goal was merely not to be annoying. These are some real snippets I found that people suggested on various forums. So this first person said to think about leaving strongly functional and theological harmony behind and embrace a constant but less tonal and looser structured piece. The second person said make thematically fitting music that loops well and doesn't distract the reader from the other aspects of the experience. Most of the time, the music in a VN will be about a mood, a general ambience. Then the last person said, They're usually easily forgettable. Unless you listen to it for a long time, you likely won't remember the kind of everyday happenings track that always pop up in slice-of-life games. Sure, to some extent they're right. 
A simple loop could be exactly what the story needs. But the idea of limiting your music to merely an extension of ambience is totally wasted potential. There's so much more that can be done to enhance your story. So I'm here today not only to show you some ways to achieve this, but also to demonstrate that it doesn't have to be difficult. In fact, I made this entire presentation in RenPy in just three weeks. Admittedly, with a bit of help from a friend who's a visual novel programmer, but I was able to get the bulk of this up and running by myself. He did a little bit of the tougher coding parts, but really I was able to get the vast majority of this done with little experience. So for those of you who don't know, RenPy is one of the most popular visual novel game engines out there. It has lots of features that are specifically catered to the medium that other engines just don't offer. Plus, it's pretty easy to use. I don't know how to program, I hadn't even touched the game engine before, yet I was able to make this entire presentation. So if I could do this with no experience, any programmer you work with could go even further with it. If I could do something with my little knowledge, they could go so far beyond what I could even imagine and talk about here. When you hear examples later on, they aren't just musical mock-ups of what they might sound like in-game. They're actually programmed into the engine the way they would be for a real visual novel. So for the final bit of information to get out of the way, I'd like to warn you that there will be very mild spoilers for some of the VNs we analyzed today. Unfortunately, that's unavoidable, but I did manage not to ruin anything major in the plots. My other disclaimer is that while this presentation is entirely safe for work, I cannot promise that all of the games referenced are. So if you're going to play them, just be aware of that. The presentation will be broken up into parts. The first thing we're going to discuss is the approach I took to writing music for the project Phantom of the Blooming Rose. We'll examine how I got to those choices as well as how they affected the telling of the story. Then we'll look at some of the other visual novels and examine what made their music implementation so effective. Now let's get started. The first part of my process was to find out about the project by asking a lot of questions. The more you know about the project going in, the more you can make music a part of the story. And I'm only going to show you a brief idea of that here, but seriously, ask anything you can think of. The more you get know going in, the easier it will be along the way. For me, I had a few main questions in mind to ask our project lead and author. Can you tell me a bit about the tone and setting of the story? Well, she said, it's a romantic narrative set in a fantasy world, mostly focusing on the castle and its grounds. When compared to reality, it would definitely play around the 1800s or a little later. Already, this tells me quite a bit about what I think the music should sound like, but I wanted to know what she had in mind. A classical music style to match the era that the game is set, but still has the visual novel soundtrack type to it. So that's perfect. Between the era and the genre, I'm already imagining the music of some of my favorite romantic era composers, and with a little visual novel twist to it. We now have our first step done, picking not only a style of music, but the overall emotional tone. The first adjective she even used was romantic, so that's going to factor into a lot of my decisions from here on in. And so I ask, oh by the way, is there any sort of tie-in to the music in the story? As we'll discuss a bit more later, some of the most effective ways you can use music to enhance is by literally making it part of the story. I actually crowdsourced some ideas for visual novels to talk about in this, and a lot of the most recommended ones were ones where there was a character who sang, or where music was just somehow part of the actual story, and the characters interacted with it in a meaningful way. And so... Obviously, that's going to be the best way music can enhance your story, but it's not always going to be applicable, so make sure you find out if it is. And in this case, it was. Actually, the main character is a violin player, and it's important to her character. So, at this stage, I also like to ask for references of what they're shooting for with the project. It's always just good to be on the same page so you don't get any crossed messages later on or if she has any goal in mind that she might want from the music. But since the answer to these are highly variable, you have to look at them on a case-by-case -case basis, rather than going through the exact conversation I had. 
My general point being the more you know going in, the more efficiently and effectively you can start thinking about the soundtrack. The next step of the process for me is reading the script for the first time. I'll take general note of what emotions I felt where, but no musical ideas yet. Sometimes locking in ideas too early is a terrible thing. It's honestly kind of hard to explain, but sometimes if you put the ideas too early into writing, you sort of get limited to them and don't think of new ones that you might have come up with. Next, I make a new blank copy of the script and mark points I want to hit. This sort of just gives me an idea of the pacing. Again, there's no specific musical ideas at this point. I'm still just trying to get a feel for everything. Some considerations at this stage might be identifying which moments have the most impact on my initial read-through, or if there's a change in the story I really want to highlight, or even if I notice a long scene and want to look for moments where subtle shifts could keep the music from getting too stale. Obvious points for these sorts of things might be character entrances, exits, scene changes, or changes in the topic of conversation. Really, anything that just sort of jumps out to you is an important part in the story. After I take all these notes, I send them to the project lead to make sure we're all on the same page. If they're trying to emphasize one thing and you're looking at something else, it's important to work out this before getting writing started. If you're too far into the process and you have to redo things or you have to change things or compromise, someone's just going to end up unhappy with the finished product. So seriously, get this out of the way first. Once it's all approved, I make yet another version of the script and start making notes of musical ideas and where I want to use them. We'll discuss some of these ideas in just a moment, but it's important at the stage to not forget about logistics. Being the composer, I like to imagine what would sound best, not what would be practical, and that's not always the best when you're on a video game. That's why my next step is to check with the programmer to make sure all of my ideas are workable, and often to convince them that they're worth the extra effort. Because after all, no matter what you write, if the programmer doesn't want to spend the time to put it in the way you envisioned, it's kind of pointless and a moot point anyway. You also want to take this time to do some organizational setup. For me, this means creating asset spreadsheets with all the information I might ever need to keep track of. Once you get really deep into the project, you'll be happy you don't have to rely on your memory for anything. In the background here, you can see a bit of a bare bones example of what I mean. When I'm finished with a project, it will likely have a lot more columns and information than this. Some things I'll take note of are file name, version, how it's implemented, where it's implemented, mixing considerations, etc. Really, absolutely anything I think of and I might forget. Seriously, write everything you come up with down. It's also beneficial because somehow having it in writing will let the idea morph in your head without being worried about losing that original thought you had. The final piece of advice I want to give is to always have a blank version of the script open while you're working. When writing music for a film or even something non-linear like a game, I often find having a video handy is essential. Sometimes you'll be writing something and think it works for a scene or even that it doesn't work for a scene. But when you actually experience it in context, it's a totally different sensation. You can sort of tell if a piece of music is sad on its own, but you can't tell if it's the right type of sad without the context of whatever you're writing to. This is just true generally for writing to any sort of media. I'm not sure why, but it's definitely essential. And since that doesn't quite apply to this medium, having the script open is the next best thing. Every time I get stuck or I'm not sure which musical choice to make for a scene, reading the script with a work in progress playing is always the best choice. I also don't submit the music to the project lead until I've done this, just to recheck again that it really works the way I expect it to. Adding context to your soundtrack can make it infinitely easier to give your game a musical vision. But with all that prep work out of the way, we can get to the best part, coming up with the music. So one of the troubles that the composer faces when writing music for visual novels is the subtlety. A story is often enhanced by the nuance of each and every word, something that the composer just can't hope to match. That's where the simple loop and crossfade idea comes from, a fear of trampling over the words and story. We don't know what pace the player is going to read it at. Some people are fast readers, some people are slow readers, some people might get distracted in the middle of the sentence. You just never know. 
So when the action is changed by the nuance in each of those small ideas, there's just no way you can accurately follow them with the music. So that's where these loops come from. They're just kind of unobtrusive. They set a tone and kind of just stay out of the way so they don't accidentally bulldoze any of that nuance in the story. And it's just there to set an overall emotional tone rather than capture the full depth of the writing. If the music changes too much, it might not line up with the speed the player's reading. And if it's really changing too rapidly, the whole thing might feel disjointed. On the other hand, if it doesn't change enough, the player will go crazy or even worse, mute the music. And of course, as the composer, that's something you never want. So how do we have variety without having too much variety? One consideration to counter this issue is one of the simplest to do but hardest to master. It's using space to your advantage. With just a static image and minimal sound design, it can be really scary to let your story have silence, especially if there's no voice acting. The last thing we'd want is for the player to get bored and just kind of zone out because there's nothing going on. It can be so tempting to fill your game with wall-to-wall -wall noise because that's how a lot of media is. The last thing we want is for the player to lose interest, but using breaks in music can actually be your friend when done right. There are lots of ways to play with space in your soundtrack. One of my favorite examples is from a horror VN I've played. It even took the idea of space to an extreme by making use of extended silences. The music you're hearing now is actually from Phantom of the Blooming Rose, but I'm putting it in the context by telling the story of this other VN, and just to hopefully show you kind of what it would sound like and give you a general idea. So, in this game, whenever you entered a new scene, if something scary was going to happen soon, the music would cut out completely. You'd be going along with your life, trying to figure out where to go next. Oh, maybe that old house would be fun to look around. Then as you walk in, the door slams and the music is suddenly... gone. That silence did a wonderful job of making the player hyper aware of the story and sort of pulling the reader into themselves a bit. Your heartbeat and breathing almost become part of the game at that point. It almost made it feel like it was happening in your house with you. It conditioned us to start feeling afraid every time there was silence and we became acutely aware of our own sounds and heartbeat and breathing. It's almost like the video game equivalent of 433 in a way. Then they even took this a step further. Once the pattern of music dropping out before a scare was established, it morphed. They would play a short sound that you thought would be terrifying, but wasn't. The silence in this way almost became what you were listening for. Using space purposefully like this, not once did the silence feel like something was missing. However, pure silence isn't the only way to create some variety in your score. You could try ambience to contrast the music. While this does get into sound design territory, I still view it as a musical choice. To get an idea of what I mean, pretend you're playing Phantom of the Blooming Rose. It's a story about Rose, Princess of the Ashwell Kingdom. As you make your way through the first part of the game, you're learning about the world, the castle and the characters who play a role in your life, the five kingdoms and their influence over this world you live in, and interestingly, about the mysterious phantom thief lurking around the kingdoms. You just get an idea for all the exposition. Throughout all of this, you're being introduced to not only a lot of information, but a lot of music as well. It can be kind of overwhelming for the player. Hopefully not so overwhelming that they notice it, you just might get a little ear fatigue. So that's why sometimes leaving space isn't the score, is exactly what the reader needs. Your ambience can become breathing room. It sort of lets the player relax for a little bit, even if it's just emotionally relaxation. When the main character Rose first steps out into this garden, we are greeted by a gentle afternoon. It's pretty quiet, but you can hear some birds in the distance and maybe a light breeze every once in a while. It creates a nice change of pace from the previously playing music while also setting the scene for the player. However, these two states of ambience and music don't have to be mutually exclusive. For the first time Rose enters the garden, I wanted to let the ambience just stand for itself. It was meant to be a bit of a brief respite, just a moment for the player to sit and relax as Rose is. But in a later scene, music is brought in as well. We will look more in-depth into this musical choice later, 
but by using both the ambience and music together, we create yet another texture and variation for the score. Just again, anything to keep it from being the same over and over and over again. Creating more shape to the story, sculpting the highs and the lows, but this only lasts so long before moving on to something else. Using space also doesn't have to be too drastic like the previous two examples. Sometimes a brief pause can be extremely effective and all you need. Sometimes the quiet can be used simply as a transition between scenes, or other times it can be used as a way to force a change of pace in the story, which we'll look at a bit later. But my favorite is that it can be used in a more subtle manner by breaking your expectations. The music might be playing along and no major scene changes, but your main character is getting kind of a bit flustered. She isn't quite sure what to say. Maybe she should try for a joke. But when those don't work, it can be kind of... awkward. But that only lasts for a moment before things move on, and the pace of the story as well as the music can continue. Those little pauses can act as a sort of punctuation, but as with a lot of techniques, you want to make sure not to overdo it. Another simple use of both space and music is using a one-shot, something that only plays once without looping. This can be a short three-note phrase, or even a full piece of music that doesn't loop. You can use these to emphasize a dramatic moment like a big strike on shocking news, or they can be strung together into a series of musical moments that can follow the story at whatever pace the player decides to read. Maybe each line of the dialogue triggers another musical idea. In this instance, the player's reading speed would be dictating the intensity or the speed of the music. If they need space, it'll be there without ever missing an important moment in the story. Or you can have one play in the middle of a silence just to break up the space a little bit. Especially if these are short melodic ideas like the three notes you heard earlier, or even just a measure or two of music, it can be very effective in drawing attention to specific moments without needing a full piece of music. It's literally changing with the player and they are controlling the music. And as we'll look at later, when the player can feel like they're interacting with something more than just the story, it's always going to enhance the experience. A solution to the subtlety problem mentioned earlier. Other times, you want to leave it up to the player if they want to rest or not. An example of this in Phantom of the Blooming Rose would be the violin solo you heard earlier over the garden ambience. It plays once, full through, before allowing the ambience to live on its own again. After it finishes playing, the reader can either move right along, or just sit and listen to the birds. In a slightly different direction, one-shots can be used for creating arrangements. The problem with loops is that they simply start, and then they start again, with no clear beginning or end. But by using a one-shot, you can create a form with an intro and an outro. RenPy has an amazing queuing system that can be used to create a seamless playlist of music. Rather than just starting your loop from the point you're going to hear over and over again, why not start with a one-shot? Because if we hear a piece of music starting the same way each time, that start and therefore loop point becomes instantly recognizable, and that's the last thing we want. We don't want the player realizing when the music's looping. And then on top of that, think about any piece of music you listen to. It always starts. It doesn't ever feel like it's starting in the middle. It sort of builds to something. It introduces itself. And that's what you can do with these one-shots. Something that can really introduce the piece of music and make that loop point slightly less recognizable. You could write a nice intro that starts the piece, but it's not part of the loop. And similarly, this technique can be used to create an outro, keeping music from abruptly ending as well. By having it play only once after the previous section, it can give your music a nice conclusion, or even just a little bit of a musical cadence. Or even by simply writing multiple variations on the same music and playing them in a row on a playlist. This would be very similar to looping your music, but keep it from being exactly the same each time. A little variation can go a long way. Then, as an added bonus, you can also use them on their own to distinguish certain scenes from each other. So sometimes you might use those variations in a playlist, and sometimes they might just stand on their own. Anything to just create something that breaks up the monotony a little bit.
Another way that you can use your music to enhance rather than simply exist is to tie it to the story, not just the mood. One of the most common ways to achieve this is through the use of musical themes. I'd like to point out that I use the term musical themes rather than melodic. Certain musical ideas such as genre, texture, meter, harmony, or pulse can act as your sort of theme. They all have the ability to tie you to a specific event or location or character very quickly. One example I used in Phantom of the Blooming Rose was a musical idea for the thief. While the melody is introduced here, it's not the main focus. It isn't the melodic statement quite yet, it's just about the feel. Throughout the story, I want to tie a triple compound feeling to the thief. For those of you who aren't musicians, a triple compound feeling is just a way of describing the meter and the subdivision of the beats. It's not very important, but even if you don't understand it on an academic level, you'll be able to hear it. It's that sort of waltzy feeling that you'll start to recognize throughout the soundtrack. You'll find this waltz pattern all over the game. In this piano intro, we get a sense of it. It's a little foreshadowing of the melody. Meter is great for this because even someone who isn't listening to the melody at all will likely feel the pulse as they read, and it'll also make that melody as it develops a little more recognizable. Here's the second hint of the melody in the game. You can still clearly hear the feeling of threes, although decidedly less waltzy. This time with a slightly larger instrumentation as strings are added gradually throughout. This one flows a bit and has a bit of a swaying feeling as opposed to the faster waltz. The melody will become more and more present throughout each later iteration, finally culminating in its and the thief's grand reveal. Yet, even though we only hear the melody hinted at in these earlier tracks, by keeping a consistent metric feeling it creates a unity between them and sort of makes it more clear that they're representing the thief. A musical continuity that not only links the listener to the character, but also grows with it. I won't spoil the fun of what all this leads up to, but let's just say the theme keeps getting bigger and bigger. Another use of theme in the story actually brings me to my next technique, tying the music directly to the world. Most often this can be done with diegetic music, or music that is from an in-game source. We've all had that moment where we're watching a movie or playing a game where we're just sort of brought out of the world momentarily. Hey wait, where is the orchestra hiding in this World War II battle, or the synthesizer, or drummers, or you get the point. Diegetic music doesn't have that problem because it's emanating from a source in the game world. In other words, the characters can hear the music too. That violin solo we mentioned earlier is a perfect example of this, as well as use of one-shots. It's actually been performed by Rose in the garden. The fact that it's diegetic gives it a purpose other than just setting the mood, and the fact that it doesn't loop not only adds space and keeps the music from being too repetitive, but it's realistic. There's no reason she would be sitting there playing the same piece of music over and over again in an endless loop, because why would she do that? That would honestly be kind of creepy to just see someone dead-eyed playing the same music over and over again endlessly. So, not only does it add space and a connection to the story, but it also develops her character through the use of theme. By this point in the story, the player will likely feel her violin solo here sounds very familiar. Well, it's a, well, it's the same theme the player first hears on the main menu screen, albeit in a much smaller texture. Yet the link is still very much there. In fact, while the violin performance is rubato and embellished, it's exactly the same musically. This subtle tie-in establishes a melodic idea that's connected to her, in a similar way to what we already saw for The Thief. Although, maybe there is a reason this one's in a compound field too. Hmm. The final techniques I wanted to discuss for this project have to do with allowing the music to evolve over time. This is an especially important consideration if you either want to highlight a temporary shift in the tone of a scene, or if you're worried about the music becoming too monotonous and looping too many times in a row. In Phantom of the Blooming Rose, I did this for their early game tension music. The scene was fairly tense, and that wasn't changing. I could write another tension track and have that one enter in after a while, sure, but I realized that right in the middle of the scene, the tone changes slightly, and therefore the energy. It was still tense, and it doesn't warrant a full change in my music, but I still wanted to highlight that moment. I wanted to play with the energy level a little bit there. So what did I do? I switched between variations of the same music. 
This can be especially effective if you've heard the music previously in the story because it offers more variety for the player. This piece is exactly the same as the other one, not a single difference musically, note for note, it's all the same. The difference lies in the instrumentation. By keeping the same music but giving it to a different instrument, we get not only variety but continuity. Then you can either keep going with this new piece of music until the next scene, or you can always switch right back once the moment you want it to highlight is passed. There are even multiple ways to do this in RenPy. You can always fade different channels in or out like I did. Since the music is exactly the same, I start them both playing at once. Then at the moment I want to switch, I bring the volume of one to zero and the other to full. Then to switch back, I just do the opposite. But the engine also lets you get the current time of playing music. Using this, you could even create a bit more of a complicated system if you'd like. You could, for instance, say, okay, find the current time of the playing music, and let's say that's 36 seconds. Then you could have it say, play the next piece of music from the same point. So the next piece of music would start from 36 seconds. Or you could have it remember where it left off and continue from where it left off. Just those sorts of things. By taking the time, you can create more advanced musical ideas. You could even use this idea of fading different tracks in and out musically as a way to evolve the music. If you write a piece of music in stems, which are individual audio files containing only some of the instruments of a piece, or just various not whole pieces of the piece, then you could highlight incredibly subtle shifts in your tone. A scene might be escalating, and rather than just having a static piece of music come in at some point, the music can actually grow with it. Because again, you can't have a growing piece of music because you don't know if the player is going to read along with it at the right pace. So you could start things off with just one or two instruments, or in this case, just the strings and piano. Then you can add another and another as the player progresses through the story, allowing the texture to change with the story, or in this case, by adding the rest of the orchestra. Again, the possibilities of what you want to bring in and out are limitless. It also doesn't have to be limited to just specific instruments. Any piece of audio can be brought in or out like this, or if you add or remove layers carefully enough, you could even theoretically have one ever-evolving piece of music for long segments of your project. And that's a very complicated idea, but if you want a great example of it, check out music implementation for Red Dead Redemption. That's how they sort of do it, and it's really cool. By slowly removing and adding new harmonies and melodies, the piece could change over time with the story, following the action perfectly. This technique would likely result in the most nuanced musical arc, but wouldn't be ideal for sudden shifts. You can't change all the stems at once, because then that's just changing to a new piece of music. And these are just a few of the techniques I used while working on Phantom of the Blooming Rose, but the possibilities are near endless for creative ways you could use music to enhance the story. For the next portion of this presentation, I wanted to take a look at a few more techniques in practice. Ones that I've seen put to spectacular use in other visual novels, in my opinion. So, I bet this isn't the example you thought I was going to move on to, was it? Well, that highlights the next point I want to make, though. Expectation is everything. One night, I was watching a YouTube video from the Elders React series where they were playing The Last of Us. They get to a scene where they're in a house and there's an explosion off in the distance outside somewhere. The woman playing decides to get low to the floor and put some distance between herself and the window. And she tells the camera that it's because if there's another explosion, the glass might break and hurt her. At that moment, I realized she was so much more immersed in the video game world than I ever could be. Walking into that same room, I never for a million years would have considered the windows might shatter. In real life, she'd be absolutely correct, but I have played enough games to know that was never going to happen. It's just sort of a gamer's intuition. You have an expectation of what's going to happen, and you know the limits of the medium, whereas she wasn't aware of that. As gamers, we start to have these expectations because we have seen them done so many times before. And that's why one of the very effective techniques can be to play with those expectations. If people are going to expect boring old loops from your visual novel, then use that to your advantage. And that's exactly what the first title I wanted to talk about did. Welcome to the VN Doki Doki Literature Club. As you can tell, it's a psychological horror game, but I'm not joking though. It's a story about joining an after-school literature club and getting to know the other club members. It's also a story with some really stark turns. 
While we're going to focus mainly on the music side of things, everything about this game makes use of subverting your impressions. Right from the get-go, you can see the bright pastel colors and happy music, completely masking the darkness hidden beneath. In the case of the music, they introduce to all these simple, happy tracks one at a time, each one coming in at a specific point in the story like you might expect, the same way any other music in a visual novel comes in. From this, we subconsciously tend to assume we know what the music should sound like from here on, because again, we've heard it done like this a billion times before. So later in the game, when we hear a familiar theme, we already know how it goes. Or so we think. Glitches and abnormalities start to be introduced to the music gradually. In general, they're so effective because they're subtle, but I chose this one because it's pretty easy to notice after listening to the normal version moments ago. In the actual context, they don't stand out nearly so much, but when you aren't expecting them, they specifically didn't want you to be sure about what you just heard. The whole game feels like a descent into madness, and this questioning of your own ears certainly adds to that feeling. After all, if you're listening to the same music on loop in the background that you've heard countless times before, you probably aren't too focused on it. So if something strange happens very quickly, you might be more inclined to question whether you heard anything at all. These are made even more effective thanks to Renpai's queuing feature. By making a playlist of the glitched versions along with the normal versions and different glitched versions, the player can never know which one to expect, sort of like the variations we talked about earlier. If the same glitch were to happen over and over again at the same point, it would lose some of its impact. But by making these playlists in the game engine, it makes you even less sure of what you just heard. One of my favorite ways he creates this kind of effect is with a loop point. Take a listen to the loop in this track. This is the track Ohio Sayori from the game. So pretty seamless. It goes through the track and starts again just the same as any other loop. But later in the game, you get a version with this loop point. That one's not so seamless. Now, it isn't quite as effective out of context, because imagine for a second. The same loop you've heard a bunch of times already is playing in the background. You hear it, but you really don't pay attention to it. Then all of a sudden, you hear a weird drop in the music. What was that? How did that happen? Well, while it was technically the same track you have been hearing throughout the game, it's not the same file. This one has been sped up very, very, very gradually over the duration of the entire track. It's done so slowly that you really don't notice that it has gotten faster until it suddenly gets back to the beginning, and you get that weird effect you aren't quite sure you heard. Another way these musical deviations are able to become so jarring is by playing with the expectation of game mechanics as well. Visual novels generally don't have much in the way of those. You click and something happens, you click again and the next thing happens. It's as basic as you can get. If I were to click after this line, seeing a new picture wouldn't surprise you at all. And that's why DDLC actually ties some of the visual shifts to the music rather than to the player's input. That is particularly clever because it guarantees that the music will line up with the dramatic moments in the story. And it also makes the player feel like things are happening beyond their control. The last technique used that I want to mention is one we've actually looked at earlier but used in a different way. There's a scene in the game where you're reading the poetry of other club members. There's music going along in the background as expected, but when you start reading someone's writing, it starts playing a different version of the same track, seamlessly switching to a reorchestrated version unique to that character, then eventually switching back to the default version when you stop interacting with the character. So take a look what I mean in the gameplay example. <laughs> 
as you hopefully heard, each character you interact with had their own version of the same music. This ties certain instrumentation to certain characters and is also a nice way of making the music matter to the story. You have no way of knowing this unless you play the game, but the instrumentation actually matches the personality of the characters as well. You sort of get more playful, childlike instruments for one character, the piano and strings for another character, just sort of demonstrating their personalities a little bit through their instrumentation as well. And I also want to give a huge shout out to Dan Salvato who made this game. He has no idea who I am, but when I reached out to him with questions about the game, he was more than happy to answer them. So I really hope I did proper justice to all of his work. The next game I want to look at is called Symphonic Rain. This one actually tells the story of a student attending an elite music conservatory, so the soundtrack is vital to the story. It uses the music in all sorts of unique ways, even including a practicing mechanic where the player can go to the room and practice on their instrument and sort of have a rhythm-like game to interact with the score. While this and some other VNs like it might make great use of their audio, I'm not going to go too in-depth into these, partly for time's sake, but also because a lot of them are techniques that are very specific to this story. So while they're very interesting to study, they aren't the most practical unless you're making a game with the same exact setting. However, there are still some lessons we can still take away from that that are widely applicable. While it's not a hard and fast rule, this novel oftentimes ties musical shifts to very specific events. Playing through the first portion of the story, we can notice a few general states. The music almost never plays when the main character is alone, but when there are other characters on screen, there's almost always music. This is even further brought to the listener's attention due to the fact that the main character is the only one who isn't voice acted. This means we are left with just silence or ambience when the main character is alone. So you can hear how the music pushes the energy when a character enters, but it also maintains the setting through the ambience. I think this technique is particularly effective for two reasons. As I mentioned earlier, in terms of using space, it really brings the player into themselves a bit. It, by having these changes in mood when the main character is alone, it makes things feel a lot more solitary and just kind of isolating. Then, on the reverse side, when another character shows up, it makes it feel more meaningful and sort of brings up the energy of the scene. But on top of that, it actually helps reinforce the setting. The game gets its name from the fact that in this town, it rains every single day, with no exceptions. Hopefully, without me even pointing it out, that really set the mood in the previous video. By giving that space in the music, it often pulls us into the environment via the constant waves of rain in the background. By making choices like this, the game is better able to craft the emotional and tonal arc that draws the reader in and keeps them invested. Clever entrances and exits of music can make a huge difference. But what if all those musical entrances weren't programmed in at all? What kind of sick world would it be where the music had a certain amount of chance to it? Just anarchy. Well, welcome to Valhalla Cyberpunk Bartender Action, because that's exactly that world. Self-described as a bosom up about waifus, technology, and post-dystopia life, it doesn't easily fit into a typical category. But that very fact, the fact that it isn't bound by traditional VN mechanics is precisely why I wanted to discuss it. It has many unique pieces of gameplay beyond just the story, but especially the way music is implemented. Rather than simply playing in the background endlessly as we might expect, the music actually is entirely diegetic and player controlled. Working in a bar, you have access to a jukebox that allows you to choose a playlist of music you'd like to hear during the day. 
For me, this works so well due to four main reasons. The first is that it's entirely diegetic. In this type of setting, you'd expect constant background music because bars are just kind of creepy and dull without any music in the background. And it really makes you feel like you're in the bar with them. Various tracks just playing in the background as you go about your business the way they would in a bar. And the second reason is that it creates variation in the music. Assuming that the player doesn't choose the same tracks over and over again, it's a guarantee that things won't be too repetitive. And even if it's a bit repetitive, that's okay because the player chose to do it. If you look at the comment section for music about this game, you'll see people talk about their perfect playlist that they use every time. And that's repetitive, but it's chosen by them. Next is that it creates player interaction. Anytime the player can feel like they're influencing the story, art, or music, they're going to be more engaged. Because think about it, when you have a story-based game like these, what are the things you tend to remember? They're the big choices that you made. You go to friends and say, oh, what choice did you make? What choice did you make? And that interaction is what sort of creates the connection to the game. So when we can connect with something that's not just the game, but in this case, the audio, it makes the experience more meaningful. And this can be a bit scary if you're someone who really wants to control your audience's experience. But done well, allowing the player this freedom can go a really long way. It's very similar to the idea that interactive music in games is almost like letting the player be the arranger, the orchestrator, the conductor. They're sort of controlling the musical experience rather than the composer. But that's an entire talk on its own. Then lastly is the fact that it adds a sense of progress. Not all of the music is unlocked from the start, so it gives the players something to achieve. While this isn't a game mechanic that can be strictly used in a lot of games, I think the idea is important. These ideas of player choice and making the music make sense in context can go a long way in many situations. However, that isn't to say that traditional implementation can't have its uses too. I think my next example is a prime demonstration of this fact. While researching the talk, as I mentioned earlier, I took to Reddit to ask for recommendations I should check out. Ace Attorney was by far one of the most suggested series. It's a game where you play as a defense attorney using legal arguments and evidence to try and defend your clients. There's a lot of quick back and forth dialogue that keeps the pacing of this one often pretty fast. And that's why it's so important for the music to keep the energy up. It sets the pace for the reader in a lot of ways. Plus, the music is extremely memorable and beloved by its players, which is probably why it's suggested so much. However, I did notice that the audio is so much more than just catchy and well-written. In fact, the points I want to discuss for this one are fairly standard implementation-wise, but used quite effectively. The first thing I really liked was that the music usually didn't just fade out. While it ultimately still ended whenever the player clicked to the next moment, it felt extremely intentional. While playing, you might not even notice that the music stopped because it draws less attention to itself than a simple fade-out might. The fact that the game often uses similar sounds for punctuation, regardless of whether the music is stopping or not, helps to make them feel more and more natural. If you rewind a little bit in this video, you can listen to that example again, and you'll hear the same sounds, but the one that triggers the music to end isn't the same one. So you never know exactly hearing this sound is going to end the music and therefore become predictable. Basically, anything that helps the music here avoid fades and crossfades can go a long way to making the soundtrack feel like it's part of the story. Especially in quick paced scenes, these hard cuts move things along in a way that slower fades never could. In the courtroom, when tensions are high and two people are verbally fighting each other, the last thing you want is for the music implementation to feel sluggish. And fading things in and out all the time is exactly what would happen in that situation. It would just start to pull and push as the music's going in and out. And it takes a lot of the way of the drama and the pace to that story. Another aspect I enjoyed was the fact that a lot of those stingers or one shots are musical rather than just hits. <laughs> Thank you.
So that quick little musical gesture not only was used for impact, but sometimes it changes the tone very briefly. In the example you just heard, the sound plays over the music, it sort of becomes part of it. And in fact, if you don't know the music, it might even sound like it was part of it, but that little twinkle on top actually is not part of the loop. It just adds some emphasis without changing the moment. However, other times the music is actually ducked for these sound effects. Notice how in the following clip, the music briefly gets quieter on the playing of this musical stinger. In fact, the same musical stinger. My first instinct here was that the music was just ducking to make the sound effect clear, but then I thought about it. I realized that it does so much more than that. In the other example, the music remains static while a musical stinger played over it. So why would this one be different? Well, I believe it's because in this context, it purposely wants to change the momentum briefly. It wants you to inspect the new info, whereas in the other example, the pacing of the scene never actually changed. Just for a brief moment, the intensity pulls back while you examine this clue before snapping right back up to the previous volume. It's also worth noting that this game makes use of short cutscenes. While these aren't interactive and therefore out of the scope of this talk, I think they add to the soundtrack as a whole. Even if these are only short, interspersed moments of music that are scripted, they sort of make the rest of the audio feel more tied to the visuals as well. It's almost like your brain will get tricked into looking for more connections that aren't there. By establishing intention in your music, you can kind of get away with it later on when there isn't intention because the player sort of fakes their own in a way. All of these techniques are rather traditional and implementations we hear commonly, but used in the right context and amounts, they can be very beneficial to your story. For the final example, I want to show you just one more case in the importance of purposeful musical choice. Fate Stay Night It. It's another VN with an extremely simple music implementation system and an extremely complex story. I honestly don't think this one can be summarized quickly and without spoilers, so I'll just let the music speak for itself on this one. I think most notably, it chooses which music it plays with large amounts of intention. It creates a very dramatic story through the building up of a sort of musical vocabulary that's specific to this soundtrack. One thing that this talk unfortunately can't fully provide is context for a lot of these examples. So for this one especially, you have to remember that visual novels can take up to tens or even hundreds of hours of time. So once you get a good chunk of the story, you already know the music pretty well. You've internalized it, it's really become a part of you. So after a while of reading, I know when I hear this next piece of music that something silly is going to happen. And similarly, I know that when I hear this next piece of music, something bad is going to happen. And quite often, that bad thing is going to be a fight. So, of course, to some extent, the actual composition of these tracks alludes to the action in the story, but by hearing them over and over again in the same context, things become really solidified for the reader. You could hear that first silly music in every fight scene, and at first that might be kind of weird, but I promise you, after hearing it enough times, your brain will start associating those sounds with the fight, and it'll become the fight music and be, in some ways, just as effective as the music you're hearing now. The music becomes a sort of shorthand for how we should feel without the story having to take the time to explicitly state it. This by itself can be sort of convenient, and is by no means tied to the fact that these tracks fade and loop. We could make this kind of effect of intention with any type of implementation. Any sort of deliberate music choice can have an effect like this. But where I think this strategy really shines is in its variations. When you hear the same music over and over again, these associations build. Expectations start to develop as we saw in some of the previous examples. But that's exactly what makes it so much more powerful when something different happens. Not in a shocking way like you might hear in a horror game, but an emotional one. It's almost like a huge emotional release when we hear a new piece. In a way, it allows the soundtrack to act as a gradual build to these huge moments. It creates a great contrast, not only in terms of musical texture, but also because we feel like we finally made real progress. After a while of hearing the same music over and over and over again, it can, unfortunately, become monotonous, 
and we sort of get trapped into those associations like okay here comes another fight scene here comes another silly scene but hearing something new it kind of makes us feel like we're making progress we're getting somewhere and we aren't hearing those same tracks over and over again anymore by using this music only once in a big scene it makes it more special while there's already a shorthand established for this motion, hearing a new glorious melody will have way more of an impact. It's honestly kind of hard to explain the feeling it can create, but at the very least it should be very obvious why you would want a pivotal moment in your story to feel unique. In a slightly different direction, this can also be used for confusing the reader. If you want the player to be unsure of how to feel, suddenly introducing a new, ambiguous piece of music can be very effective. Fate Stay Night makes great use of this when the narrator becomes unreliable and the reader is left unsure of what is going on. By hearing this new piece of music out of nowhere, we don't know how to feel, and that's exactly what we're supposed to be feeling in a sort of ironic way. By introducing a new piece of music, you feel just as unsure as the main character, breaking the comfort and familiarity that the soundtrack had previously been providing. An effect that wouldn't be nearly as impactful if you were regularly hearing this music. And this music can even be established for the endgame after it has had its impactful moment. So once we've had this first moment of what is going on, we can establish this as the new confused music. So despite simple implementation, this VN is able to achieve huge emotional moments. So now, as we begin to wrap up this talk, I want to emphasize something. This was just a brief example of some of the ways music can be used. There are countless others that have already been done, and an infinite amount more that may not have been thought of yet. To me, that's the most important point. Not that these are the true, correct way to do things, but instead, I hope these points got you thinking about the potential your soundtrack can have. I also want to emphasize that having simple loops that fade in and out can be very effective. Sometimes that's exactly what the project will call for. I'm not trying to take anything away from that, that tried and true formula at all. Instead, my hope is that you'll think about how the audio experience of your game can enhance, rather than just going for the standard without giving it a second thought, like I would have if I chose a PowerPoint for this presentation. So with all that said, does anyone have any questions? And obviously you can't actually ask me them because we're on the internet, but I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you learned a lot. And I want to give a huge thank you to all the Creative Commons art in this presentation, as well as the games mentioned and the gameplay videos I used. I'm not going to try and read these all out loud because I'm going to pronounce things wrong, so it's going to be a whole mess. But if you want to know what any of it of it was, it's right there for you. And if you have any future questions or just want to chat, feel free to contact me at any time. My email address and website are right there, where you could always comment on this YouTube video so other people could get involved in the discussion. And yeah, you know how this stuff works. So thank you so much for watching. I know you've watched a YouTube video before, so I'm not going to give you the whole spiel. You already know. Share, like, subscribe, follow, hit that bell, all those things that YouTubers say. I would really appreciate any support you can give me, and hopefully I can make more content like this for you in the future. And if there's any other topics you want to hear me cover, let me know. Or if you just want to hear some of my music, I'll likely be posting it on this YouTube channel. So thanks again for watching, and if this was helpful for you at all, please let me know.